confidence in the gospel to say the wisdom of God is wiser than that of man. Indeed, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. May we have the confidence to rest in Christ and know that the gospel is your power unto salvation for all who believe. And may we be your voice that goes out into all of the world. And Lord, may you convict any of those you bring within our sphere who claim a religion but reject Christ. All day long, you said, you stretched out your hand to a disobedient people. Even we who know you know your patience with us as we struggle with sin, but we struggle because we love Christ. How much more severe will be that judgment who hear and reject, who hear and remain obstinate to the truth. May we be faithful to proclaim that, Lord, for your glory and for the salvation of those you would call and bring near to yourself. And we pray this morning as we take tithes and offerings that you would use them for your glory. We, we offer them as expressions of faith for your glory. We ask, Lord, that you would be pleased and you would be honored with what we offer to you this morning in our service. For you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Father, you are the creator of the ends of the earth. And Holy Spirit, you are the one who indwells your people and even gives to us the desire to offer to you this prayer and our time. And we do so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
that are bound to fast and shame His righteous blood will count a claim White is coming Bright the rider Heaven singing hail the Lamb Death to We'll save our next song for next week, and uh, children are dismissed for Children's Church. Pastor Joey, would you come share with us from God's Word? Thank you, John and Heidi, uh, Daniel, and uh, Angel. Well, with that, let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for God to speak to us from His Word. And so if you've had a few moments to pray silently... ...then I'll open us up in a word of prayer. Father, your word continually points us to a promise, a promise of what you will do, a promise fulfilled in its progression throughout redemptive history, a promise fulfilled in its foundation in the coming of you, Lord Jesus Christ, in your life, your death, your resurrection, your exaltation. But a promise nonetheless, a promise yet to be fulfilled in its fullness, for we live by faith and not by sight. One day it will be by sight and not by faith, and our hope will be realized. And we need your grace to keep our eyes fixed on that hope, our minds girded, our affections guarded, our will yielded and brought gladly into submission to you, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light when we walk by the Spirit. And so accomplish these things in us and help us to look to the end, help us to see our reward, help us to own our salvation and to bring into our present experience by faith the reality that is ours by inheritance. And use your word to strengthen, nurture, comfort, guide and direct these truths and the gospel in our life, our fellowship, our prayers, ultimately our obedience to you. And so we pray now that as we come together as your people to hear you speak to us through your word, that you would be our teacher, 
Holy Spirit, and that you would fulfill that ministry of exalting Christ in us. And it's to that end that we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation chapter 2. We're coming back. We had a few weeks break, but we are back in Revelation chapter 2 as we consider the message of the risen Christ to the seven churches. The seven churches which stand as historical churches, real letters to real churches, to real people with real uh, uh, situations that they are dealing with and living in, and yet churches that also stand representatively to the kind of struggles, temptations, joys, hopes, and triumphs that mark God's people throughout all of the ages. And that is the overall Import of these message, this message to the seven churches. We have already noted several of them, three of them to be exact. We noted the church at Ephesus, where Christ spoke to them and commended them for many great things, their commitment to doctrine. And but he rebuked them because though they started in love, they did not end in love. They were in fact waning in their love and had become legalists rather than loved devotees of Christ in spirit and in truth. We looked at the message to Smyrna, which was one of the two churches that did not come with a condemnation, and we saw their faithfulness to hold fast to those things that they had been brought to believe, namely in Christ. And persecution did not sway them, it did not break them, but they held fast under God's sovereign hand in faithfulness to the gospel. And then we looked at the message to the church at Pergamum, and we saw there that they too had things to that Christ commended to them, and yet they had a sin as well. They were compromised compromising with false doctrine. They were compromising with that which was not faithful to Christ. The teaching, he says, of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. And so we come now to the fourth church, the church of Thyatira. The church of Thyatira. The church has for the all intents and purposes fallen into a sin distinct and yet similar to that of Pergamum, and Christ needs to address them in the familiar form that he has with the other churches to call them back to faithfulness and to call them back to holiness. And they stand then as an example, again, like other churches, with the temptation that has faced God's people throughout the ages and will to the end. In fact, they will not be alleviated, but will be a temptation that only increases as the age moves on towards its completion, to the completion of God's purposes in this world. And that is the temptation to compromise, the temptation to compromise. To fall into the error of tolerating those things which Christ hates. To be slow to deal with sin or error. To be slow to hold fast to the truth when it's under attack. To tend to live at a superficial level of existence, a superficial level of attachment to Christ. Or to fall into that error of thinking that the good outweighs the bad, and so therefore whatever we have that would be commended by Christ excuses what would dishonor Christ, and that somehow it will work out in the end. None of those things are true. They are not true either of the church or of us as individuals. And yet, that is a situation that has often plagued the church. We have in our day many examples of this. Certainly in a time and an era where doctrine is diminished, where holiness is not taken very seriously, and there is an abuse really of the grace of God, and an abuse particularly of the love of God. And that's not unsimilar, at least in part, to what was going on at the church of Thyatira. We have many examples of this, but one that will serve our purpose as well this morning is in 1 Corinthians 5. You don't have to turn there, I'm just going to mention it. You're familiar with this passage. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth who lived in a wicked society and was known for its tendency to adopt the patterns and thinking of the society out of which and the culture out of which they had been saved. And so much of the letters of Corinthians beyond answering questions are dealing with sin. One momentous part of God doing that through the Apostle Paul comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where there is immorality among the church and he says immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife most likely a sexual relationship between a member of the church and his mother-in-law a father's second wife and rather than confronting this sin which was grievous 
to the church and dangerous to her testimony and to her spiritual life and vitality. He says, rather, while supposedly thinking that they were in some state of humility and showing grace and extending mercy and compassion and love to this sinning member, the rebuke is this, that you have become arrogant and you have not mourned instead about the one who has done this deed. And so Paul has to take action into his own hands, and he hands this person over to Satan that they would be taught not to sin. And he says that so that their spirit may be saved, essentially on the day of judgment. And he then gives this warning, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Clean out the old leaven, because leaven here be representing sin, if not dealt with, will affect the whole church. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Do you not know that sin left undealt with is going to have a corrupting influence on the rest of God's people? Do you not know that error that is allowed to come into the church is going to have a corrupting and a perverting influence on the testimony of the church to the world and on the gospel itself? Which is why he gave the warning to Timothy, which we've mentioned in the past in 1 Timothy 4, pay close attention to your teaching and to your doctrine, for by doing this you ensure salvation for yourself and for those who hear you. We see many examples of God's concern for the holiness of His people at the very initiation of the Mosaic Covenant and the, the temple and all of those things in order to make His point clear. You remember fire came out of the tent to consume Nadab and Abihu because they offered strange fire. You had the unbelieving of heart of Israel who were condemned to wander 40 years in the wilderness and die there, that generation, and not enter into the promised land because they were unfaithful to God. You have the very beginning of the new covenant. And you have God making a point in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira by causing them both to drop dead because they were dishonest before the church and particularly lying to the Holy Spirit. And it says great fear came over the people. So God is concerned about the holiness of His people. He's concerned about truth. He's concerned about holiness. He's concerned about the testimony of His name before a watching world. He is concerned out of love for His church for everything that destroys it and is a threat to it. And His love for the church is matched by His hatred of those things that are a threat to it. And we come in part again to that with this church at Thyatira. The church at Thyatira. We're going to begin our look at it this morning, particularly going up to just the situation that they were in and his commendation, and then looking more specifically next week at his rebuke. But let's begin by just reading the passage, and then we'll look at it more closely. Begin with me, if you will, in Revelation chapter 2 to verse 18, and verse, beginning in verse 18 down to verse 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, and your love, and faith, and service, and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they may commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence." And all the churches will know that I am He who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest here in Thyatira, do not hold, who do not hold to this teaching, and who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come." He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as, and as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that is the message then of Christ to the church at Thyatira. 
who is known by this error that is going to be confronted by the Lord, that they tolerate wrong doctrine. They tolerate wrong doctrine. They tolerate wrong doctrine in the essence of its error, and they tolerate wrong doctrine in its fruit, and it's compromised with the culture around them. They lack both truth and holiness among them, and they do not confront it. And so, he needs to address it. Well, let's begin by understanding who, who he is addressing. And we'll start then with the context of the church. Who is the church at Thyatira? What is their situation? He says in verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write. Now interestingly, this church, though it is the longest of all of the addresses by the risen Christ, is in reality one of the most insignificant of all of the cities and of the lands. It's not a major center of either political importance, uh, like, or political importance like Ephesus or even like Smyrna or like Pergamum. It's rather unknown in that sense. Uh, in fact, there is the least information about this church than any of the churches, the least historical information, because it was not particularly significant. And yet here it is that Christ addresses them, and while the city itself may not have been significant, uh, his message to them is. And though it is not historically significant, it was prominent, or at least well known, for this one fact, namely that it was a important military garrison and holdout uh, the protecting a very important stretch of land within Asia Minor. So what's just a general history then of this land? Well, although a city probably existed there prior to this, it, it really is generally understood to have been formed or built up or to enter into its period of uh, significance. Uh, but under the general name as Seleucus I, this is one of the generals uh, who succeeded Alexander the Great. And as noted, it stands in a land, I don't know if we have the slide that comes up here. This pictures help. Okay, so if you can see we're moving down, there's uh, Thyatira right there in between Pergamum and Sardis. And it laid in this valley in between these low-lying hills, but this long stretch of a valley that really connected uh, those lands, Pergamum from the southern part of the southern areas. And so it was strategically important in terms of its geography. And as the kingdom of Seleucid, uh, of the, the Seleucid kingdom was built up in this area, uh, it became important to protect that, that passageway there. And so that Thyatira then became a military outpost, essentially, of the land of Pergamum. And it was there to protect, it was kind of the, protect the, any entry of any foreign lands or, or foreign invaders or whatever that would come up to uh, cause a problem. But what's really particularly interesting about that, just in terms of giving a, a lay of the land, is it's not particularly suited for that job. Uh, it's a valley, and it lies on a, what is described as a low-rising hill, so it's not very protected by uh, just the land around it. It's rather exposed and vulnerable. But it is for that reason as well that it actually became known for the fighting spirit and the tenacity of the soldiers who were stationed there because they fought to the end. And indeed, they had to because of the importance of its position. Eventually, the city, however, summarizing all of it, was overtaken by the Romans about 190 B.C. And it was at that point that it became part of the kingdom of Pergamon and a part of the general province of the Roman Empire in Asia. And later, when the Roman Empire began to grow in its strength and the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome, began to spread and have greater stability in the land, the, its role as a garrison, as a military outpost, became less important. And it really became then a center that came to know, or a city that came to know a lot of prosperity in terms of e econ its economy. It was particularly known for its many guilds, which according to one ancient inscription included this, I quote, Wool workers, linen workers, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, and bronze smiths, and so, so on. 
In other words, it was a place where there were a lot of trades and a lot of material went out from this, uh, this growing and burgeoning center of economic prosperity and importance in that region. And in fact, also, this was contributed to by its, significant, by its location uh, because it was really a communication center. Again, a lot of traffic traveled through there. There was a significant road that traveled through there with people passing up to the north and the south, particularly regions there of Asia Minor. Uh, there's a railroad that runs right through the middle of it now, which is uh, important in connecting those same lands. But because of that, many people passed through it, and goods and trade could come and go. And it knew from that, again, a rather uh, explosive growth in, the, in its economy. And in fact, it, this growth really took place, and it started taking place not long before this letter that was written uh, by the Apostle John near at the end of the first century. And in fact, the city itself, just as a side note, would it kind of come out of historical significance after the second century. So it was really just like a bright star that was there for a little bit of time. We do have some other connection with it in the New Testament. If you'll remember that Paul, the first convert, when he had his ministry, when he had, after receiving the vision to go over to Macedonia, he met Lydia, who was from Thyatira, and you'll remember she was a seller of perfect, uh, purple fabric. Some suggest that that's maybe how the gospel got to the city of Thyatira. There's no justification for that, but nonetheless, she was from there, and she was apparently a significant merchant in the selling of purple fabric. And that just again indicates the kind of trade that went far and wide uh, among the land and throughout Asia that centered in and started in the land of Thyatira. However, these trades were also not only a means of economic growth within this area, but they also became a means of struggle and temptation for the Christians who were there. These guilds, in fact, are noted by their religious practices. And it's, and it's, it's uh, often pointed out that these guilds were often associated with the worship of some deity. And so therefore to be a part of a trade and to be a part of a guild, which was essential to a person's economic connections within that culture, uh, was a temptation. There, it was often to have to participate in idolatrous practices, those things that would have caused them to commit sin, essentially. One noted this, membership in a guild was compulsory if one wanted to hold a position. And so here was the problem, and I think this quote is up there. Guild members, one says, were expected to attend the guild festivals and to eat food, part of which had been offered to the tutelary deity, which was acknowledged as being on the table as a gift from the god. At the end of the feast, gross, Im grossly immoral activities would commence. Another said this, the pressure on the Christians to participate in the idolatrous life of the people was probably linked to the guilds, for their feasts were at the heart of the social and commercial life of the city. And so that really is going to form the background of Christ's instruction to them. So here you were, this small church in this rather insignificant town, but it was one that was beginning to grow in its influence and its significance in terms of wealth and its commercial opportunities, and yet there was this catch. It was associated, much of this trade and these opportunities were associated with idolatrous worship, and so there it was. What do we do with our Christian testimony? Do we somehow justify a compromise with these idolatrous practices, but then give us a more stable position in this world and, and lack of persecution and ostracization by the culture and the society around us? Or do we renounce it all and accept the consequences? This is what they were faced with. And this is going to be a part of, again, what he addresses with the false teaching of the woman or the, associated with the name Jezebel. Now, this has always been a point of contention, hasn't it? And this is why the church stands as a message to the church throughout the ages. There's always that pressure to conform to culture. Many of you, even now, are having to face things within your job, either directly or that you see looming on the horizon, of what, how far are you willing to go to accept direct participation or some kind of affirmation of things such as critical theory, the LGBTQ movement, those are the big ones, abortion, some have to face their, that, particularly those who work in the medical field. The church has never been exempt for this. We live in a culture that's influenced by sin. And very often, the life of the Christian living in this world, though not of this world, is faced with those kind of choices. Do I keep my job? 
Or do I make a little compromise somewhere? Do I keep the favor of the culture around me, particularly maybe even to win the witness and seem winsome and likable to them? Or do I risk their censure and their ridicule in order to stay faithful to the truth? Those are always the questions that face the church. It's the questions that face these brethren at this time. And of course then, as many of the cities, and of course as uh, is, it was, was connected to the guilds, it came with a, a religious and cultural environment that would, stood in opposition to the message of Christ. Let me just briefly note that. As I mentioned earlier, it's not really well established, the history, and so there's not a, a whole lot of information historically that can be found. And a lot of the information that comes actually comes from coinage and images on the coinage uh, from that area, which, as a little side note, didn't happen until, really doesn't show up until around 50 AD, so it had been the first century, and that really marked that it was changing from a military outpost to an economic center. But as it did, and as that change came, it came with the recognition of its commitment to the gods, the gods that it associated with. Uh, one said this, speaking of its primary god, the divine guardian of the city was the conquering hero Triminus, usually depicted on horseback with a battle axe over his shoulder. I think, do we have the picture of the, you put it up there, those are some coins or some uh, images of the coins uh, there. That, the hero there, there, you see him with a battle axe, he was on a horse, and that connected to its history again as a, as a military outpost. He became sort of the uh, figurehead deity, if you will, uh, for the city of uh, Thyatira. But it was also related to another, a patron god, variously titled, as one said, Propolis, because he had uh, his temple at the front of the city. So pro would be before, polis would be the word for city. So before the city, when you entered into it, he, he received uh, recognition as a god of that city. Also known as Propater, as the divine ancestor. Pater refers to father, again pro is before, as one who is a divine ancestor of that city uh, with divine, divine connections. Helios, the sun god, Pythian, Trimenian, Apollo. This elaborate and highly composite impersonation of the divine nature with so many names and such diversity of character seems to have been produced by a syncretism of different religious ideas in the evolution of the city. The God united himself in himself the character of all sections of the population so that almighty, uh, they all, I should say, all might find in him their own nature and the satisfaction of their own religious cravings. And so there it was again. There, uh, the effect of the culture seeping into the church. So why it had a deity and it had certain associations, it was primarily marked out by this. Not so much of this exclusive worship to one deity or to these, even these couple of deities, but that these themselves took on characteristics of many of the surrounding cultures and worship from the surrounding cities so that they really had a uh, synchronized kind of worship. And that was the problem. In the fact that there was a, written into that the sort of cultural mood of that place that we could kind of adopt all of the practices around whatever made us get along and not create conflict or diversity. And so the, the church came into this kind of situation. And so what is just again a brief history of the church? Well, interestingly... Uh, while not mentioned here, and we're going to make some general connections uh, next week, uh, the Church of Thyatira, though there's not a whole lot known about it, one thing that is known about it is in that early writers of, uh, for the church uh, record one of the early heresies or one of the aberrant movements within Christianity of the, the second century, really. It's called Montanism. And Montanism was essentially an ecstatic group. They, they claimed some hold to Orthodox uh, theology. In fact, Tertullian was for a while associated with them. They claimed some hold to what they, or the Orthodox Orthodox theology of the church, uh, and yet they also claimed to have ecstatic revelations from the Spirit. They claimed to have this unique commitment to the expectation of Christ's return that led them into forms of asceticism and, and so on and so forth. But particularly they had prophetic revelations, the ecstatic utterances of the Spirit. They were marked by this direct connection to the Holy Spirit. They held to a universal priesthood 
fruit of the Spirit, not in the sense of the Reformation doctrine, in other words, our equal access to, uh, to the Father and to Christ uh, because of His priesthood, His ministry of priesthood. They meant that uh, actually in this sense. It was really an early argument for egalitarianism. And they held that there were no distinctions and that the hierarchy of the church uh, that had a male headship should be abolished. And they had, in fact, two of their main figures within Montanism were two female prophetesses, Priscilla and Maxilla, Maximilla. Now, what does all of that mean? What is interesting about that is those are Montanism, though it's not mentioned specifically here and it developed later, shows that it really becomes a fruit of the kind of thing that can come about by not heeding the warning of Christ. And in fact, what he's going to rebuke with Jezebel includes those two things. She calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and she leads my bondservants astray. So these are important things if we don't deal with error. The reality is that more error will come, and so a destruction of the church's witness. And even though they claimed to hold to orthodox, orthodox theology, they did stray too far, and they were roundly condemned, the Montanists were, uh, by the early church and the early councils. But what we see here in Christ's address to this church is that they were already demonstrating the kind of environment that would allow for this kind of error to creep, to creep in because they were tolerating these things. They were willing to compromise. They were willing to hold to a form of doctrine but acquiesce at points where the cost was too high for them. And therefore, they were easily led into not only error of teaching, but also error of living in practical ungodliness. And so he mentions her immorality, which was common. But it was their toleration of this. It was the toleration of the church of this error. It was adopting this, this cultural attitude or this mood of syncretism that allowed to not make such sharp, sharp distinctions, but to adopt what they thought they could safely and still give credence to the gospel. And Christ says, no, it doesn't work like that. And that is at the very heart of behind of the the representation of Christ that he gives to them, sir, the church as he addresses them. And so let's note next, not nearly the context, but the credentials of Christ. He says then, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write this, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. Some of that you'll remember from the earlier vision that we had of John, of Christ, before the beginning of the message to the churches. It says that, his eyes in verse 14 were like a flame of fire at the beginning of verse 15. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And as we've noted before that each of these uh, representations of Christ to the churches are pulling off parts of that vision, each of which are relative to or related to the message that he's going to give them. What is the point here? Well, interestingly and strikingly, he begins with an identification that is unique to this passage alone. He says, the Son of God. The Son of God. This is the only use in Revelation of this exact title. Of this exact title. The relationship, and it speaks of the special relationship of Christ to the Father. His eternal and His divine relationship. It is a term, or it is a title, that has emphasis on His divine nature. The Son of Man is often a title. We've already met with that in the book of Revelation. And it will be used at other places as we go throughout. And it certainly has uh, implications. And it speaks of His role as the divine Messiah. But it seems to put an emphasis on His work as the Messiah, as the Incarnate One. The Son of God puts an emphasis on His divine nature, His eternal relationship with the Father. And so while that title is only used here, He will at other places refer to God as My Father. Or He's referred to as the Father to the, of the Son as His Father. So the relationship is manifest in other ways, but the title is only used here specifically as the Son of God. And then it becomes particularly important then to recognize why. He is the Son of God here speaking to the church, the Son of God, the risen one who is at the right hand of the Father. He is the Son of God in that title already established by John, the, the writer of Revelation, in his gospel, 
which was one of the key themes. You'll remember at the very beginning, Nathaniel, you are the Son of God. And the other disciples, you are the Son of God. And throughout the whole of John's Gospel, he's emphasizing that Christ is the Son of God. And the Son of God is that eternal Word made flesh. He's continually emphasizing the divine nature. And that's the tension and the conflict with the religious culture that we see throughout the Gospel of John. And particularly, he says in chapter 20, verse 31, you're familiar with, was the very point of his writing. He says, these things I have written to you so that you may know that Jesus Christ is exactly who I've been revealing him to be in the testimony of the gospel. He says, these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That was the very point of the gospel, is to establish this title as inherent to the nature of the Messiah, that he is not only the one who would die on the cross, but he is the one who would do so as the eternal Son of God. And here he is then addressing them. Now why is that significant? Well, it's significant for many reasons. One is just because, again, of the very context of the church. While they weren't as steeped in the, the, all of the, the intensity of the emperor cultist worship, the Roman cult worship, as some of the other cities, because they weren't as politically important, it was still a presence who was there. But even more so, the gods that stood over them as a part of the identity of their city and of their worship often took on the claim, Son of God. The Roman Emperor Augustus first noted that to himself, that he was a defied a, a, a earthly representation of the gods, the Son of God. They often saw that on coins and a part of their religious worship of those related as well to Zeus. And so this stands as direct conflict to them. He says, no, in contrast to all of this temptation to synchronize, to compromise, the one who is speaking to you, who is going to call you back to obedience, is the Son of God, the only Son of God, the true Son of God. It would become significant as well to them to realize that, even as he'll mention the influence of Satan later in this uh, letter, they, they have known the deep things of Satan. It's the Son of God is the one, as John has already said in his Gospel, who came to destroy the works of the devil. It is a title that relates to his deity, to his eternal nature. It is a title that relates to his conquering the works of Satan, which is going to be particularly significant as the prophecy moves on and we see the power of Satan rise. And the one who would defeat him is going to be none other than the Son of God. To be on his side is to be on the right side, to be outside of him, and to disobey him is to be on the wrong side and on the side of judgment. And interestingly, when he says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. It is to destroy the works of the devil in totality, not only to destroy the works of the devil and the persecution he's going to bring, but more particularly into that context, the works of the devil that lead into sin, the works of the devil that distort the truth, the works of the devil that bring in error and ungodliness into his church. Christ came to destroy all of that. He came to destroy all of that. But most significantly... It is the title that reminds them that in the Son of God, because He destroys the works of the devil, He is the one who will overcome. He's the one who will overcome. As a matter of fact, again in 1 John chapter 5, He says this, Who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? They would have known of that. Who is the one who overcomes is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, who believes the testimony that God has given towards His Son. In verse 11, the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. But even more significant in that is to say that the Son of God is the one not only who destroys the works of the devil, not only the one in whom the, his people overcome, but he is more particularly the Son of God who is the true king who will break the power of the nations. If you look back at the end of the message, we'll cover it more next week. He alludes to Psalm 2 in verse 20. Six, I will give him authority over the nations. Verse 27, he will rule them with a rod of iron. 
unmistakably then in this title, he is anticipating that that promise in identifying himself with the son who will destroy the rebellion of the nations against God. The very rebellion, again, that, and destruction that is going to be unfolded throughout the whole entire book of Revelation. You remember this in Psalm chapter 2. Let me remind you. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth. As your possessions, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord in reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. And how blessed are all of those who take refuge in Him. When He introduces Himself as the Son of God, He is the one who is eternally related to the Father. He is the one who came to destroy the works of the devil. He is the one through whom His people were overcome. And He is the one who establishes Himself as the King, the one to whom all the kingdoms of the earth have been given, and He will rule over them with a rod of iron. He is the victor. He is the king. He is the only God to be kept distinct from everything else that would claim any kind of allegiance from his people. That's the point. He is the son of God who is speaking to you with all divine authority and all divine glory. The one who is truly has all divine power and will accomplish his purposes. And the one who alone is to be worshipped. The one who alone is to be believed. The one who alone can deliver his people. He is the Son of God. And he says he is the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. And again, he's picking up on the vision earlier. Now in his resurrected glory, the full magnificence of his divine nature in his omniscience and his power to judge is pictured here in eyes like a flame of fire. It is a piercing knowledge. It is a piercing knowledge. It is a knowledge where he says, I know not only your deeds that are good, but I know those that are sinful. And I will hold you to account for them. And they particularly then has emphasis on a knowledge that will bring judgment. And that really is the theme. As a matter of fact, he uses this one other time in Revelation, in verse 12 of chapter 19. As Christ is returning to judge, he who is faithful and true and in righteousness, he judges and rages, wages war, verse 12. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. His eyes are a flame of fire, his judgment will not be remiss. The punishment that he brings will not be skewed. It will not be off. It will not be influenced by anything outside of his own perfect knowledge, justice, power, and righteousness. He has eyes like the flame of fire because he is the all-seeing God. He is the one who sees. He is the one who knows. He is the one who will give to each according to their deeds. And he also has feet like burnished bronze. This speaks here, he's communicating his kingly authority, again, to trample down his enemies. His unchallenged authority, his unchallenged kingship, his unchallenged power. And again, it harks back, as we mentioned before in chapter 1, to the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 6. Don't, don't turn there. It's a part of the vision of the heavenly being that Daniel saw in verse 6. His body was like beryl. His face and the appearance, had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. He's already made several connections with the book of Daniel and the glory of God revealed there here that is attached to the Son of God speaking to His church. It speaks of His authority. It speaks of His role as King that He will trample down His enemies. He will stamp out all opposition. One captured it well like this. The eyes and the feet. With such eyes the Son of God can see into the most distant and darkest places. And with such feet He can stamp out all opposition to His rule. And there's really the idea there that God always is calling His people and saying, if Jesus 
to his church is saying, Do not fear them who can kill the body, but fear, fear him who can kill the body and soul in hell. The prophets who say often to Israel, Why do you fear man whose breath is in his mouth? Fear God who rules over the nations. And so the idea to the church here who is, he's going to confront on their compromise and he says, do you know the reality of the one whom you name? This is the Son of God. He is not ignorant to your intentions and to your compromise. He is the one who will trample down enemies. Why are you intimidated and why are you so willingly compromising on my truth when I will uphold my truth to the end? Why are you compromising on trusting me who will destroy all his enemies? The one who speaks to you is the one who has all authority and glory and whom you need to listen to. And then he goes thirdly to commend them. And that's really one of the fascinating and wonderful parts of all of these addresses to the churches. He begins in verse 19 with this theme of the glory of Christ ready to judge the king who is ready to destroy his enemies, the one with all authority who is ready to uphold righteousness and justice on all of the earth. And you're ready for this explosion of the judgment of Christ. And yet he begins with commendation, with commendation. He knows the rebuke that is coming. He knows their sin. He knows what he has against them. He knows where they are failing him. And yet, he addresses them first with a word of encouragement. With a word of encouragement. And it's really helpful for us to notice this up front. And, and it's helpful for us to observe the way that Christ speaks to his churches. It's an example for us. Namely, that we treat one another in that way. When we confront sin, that we are made sure that we also are careful to encourage what is good and what we see in one another. That we are not those who tend to be in legalistic churches, as we've noticed before, or those who have that who always seem to only be finding what is wrong and what is they can criticize, what they can condemn, what they can point out to be an error. Very little encouragement. Very little acknowledgement. It's either all bad or all good. Good usually defined in those cases by their own lives. One said this in relation to this point. Following Jesus' gracious example, when we are dealing with churches or people who need to be corrected, we would be wise to notice their strengths and praise their virtues. In this way, opening a door for the harder messages, message that they may thus be more willing to receive. Given our own weaknesses and tendencies toward failure, how wonderful it is to learn that Jesus knows, cares about, and appreciates all the good things taking our, in place in our lives as his people. End quote. Isn't it nice to know that when you're aware of your sin, Christ also sees the sincerity of your faith? Not unlike his words to Peter after Peter failed and he was ashamed and Jesus comes to him, you know, will you feed my sheep, will you feed, tend my lambs, and so forth. And Jesus kept saying, do you love me? And then finally Peter had to say, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. In other words, I only see my sin and my shame and my failure. But Lord, at the end of the day, you know that at the bottom of my heart, I actually do love you. I do want to follow you. And he knew that Jesus knew that. And it's helpful for us to be reminded of that as well. And it's helpful for us to be reminded of that as well when we address other people, that we don't lead off and make the failures the first thing that marks our address to them. I, I won't belabor this, but I do want to just mention one other point for our reminder and encouragement. That, that stands out most significantly, or in one really dramatic way, in Paul's own address to the Corinthians. Again, we noted earlier that if there's one church that really had a problem with walking in obedience and, and really keeping their lives straight, that had to keep getting this discipline from God through the apostle, it was the church at Corinth. And if many of us, if we were dealing with a church like that, what would be the first thing we'd want to do or someone like that? We'd launch right into it. We'd launch right into it. You guys are so messed up. What are you doing? You know, I've already told you this so many times. And here you are blowing it all again. Here you are going after immorality. Here you are fighting and having divisions with one another. I'm done with you. I'm tired with you. Get your act straight or I'm not coming back. That's the kind of attitude that we would genuinely have. But listen to this and think about this. When we confront error and when we think about even our times of rebuke, would we start like the Apostle Paul does, really reflecting the character of the Lord? He says this, 
to the church of God at Corinth. Those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in Him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. You're not lacking in anything, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then He launches into divisions. Then He launches into the need to address error. And so it is here with Christ, and so it should be with us, that we should be marked not only by our willingness to criticize and confront sin, not only by our willingness to address uh, restraint from the truth or lack of holiness in life, but our equal and even more vigorous willingness to encourage one another, to find testimonies of grace in one another, to find testimonies of faithfulness and evidence of faithfulness in each other's life. And so Jesus does that here. He says, I know your deeds. I know that in the midst of what I'm going to say, that you do have among you those who love me and are faithful. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. What a tremendous and tender word. Well, let me just summarize these for the sake of time here. These are all evidences of fruit of a transformed life. They're all spiritual fruits. They're all evidences of their following Christ. And each bleeds into the other as a picture of complete and genuine spirituality that demonstrates the true knowledge of the gospel. They, they demonstrate those things that actually bring pleasure to the heart of Christ, that please Him, that are evidence in His people. These are things that He delights to acknowledge, that He delights to see. Now there's different ways to group them, but... We're going to just take them each on their own. Where are his commendation? Again, briefly, he says, I know your deeds. I know and your love and faith and service and perseverance. I know your love. I know that you have the evidence of the fruit of love in your life. And he seems here, interestingly, to make a contrast. The, the term, or the, this particular form of the term love, is used only one time. It's a noun form. It's used in reference to the church at Ephesus. And he's really setting up, he seems to be, some kind of intentional contrast. Ephesus was committed to doctrine, but they left their love. He's going to address this church for straying on doctrine, but he does acknowledge up front. But I do know that you have love for Christ. I do know that you have love for me. I do know that you have started in love, and he's going to say at the end that you're actually increasing in the demonstration of it in many ways. He lists this as the head because it really is the chief among the fruits of regeneration and repentant faith. You remember Paul's words to the Corinthians, but now faith, hope, and love abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. And he says, I know that you have that. I see that testimony in you. And most likely, he's referring here because these are the works. He says, your works of love, your deeds of love, your actions of love are the idea here. In that they are, it is displayed toward others. And it's going to, again, spill out even into the other commendations. You love one another because you care for one another. You remember that Jesus told his disciples, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And he said, what is my greatest commandment? That you love one another, even as I have loved you. And he says here to this church, I see that. I see that your love for me is sincere because I see it fleshed out into your life. And because I have eyes of flame, of fire. And just even as I knew Peter's heart, I know yours, that you do love me. And you do have demonstrations of this. That you are ready to obey me in many areas. And I'm pleased with that. I know your deeds. I know that you also have faith. Faith here could be their faith in Christ or faithfulness of life, and really there's no need to be so sharp that they include one another. He commends them for the evidence of their true faith in Christ and, and really probably an emphasis on what Paul called works of faith. When he was himself commending the, churches, the church at Thessalonica, he says, 
in 1 Thessalonians, he's constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God our Father. And that's the idea here. I know your love. I know your sincerity of faith. I know your works and your labor. I know that you have a genuine trust in me. He's going to say that in Bring those together in Revelation 14 when he says this in verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith. Your faith. You've been faithful. You've kept the commandments of God. You've stayed true to your testimony to me. And not only that, but you also are marked by your ministry or your service. I know your love and your faith and your service that you demonstrated in the way that you meet the needs of each other's life. It could be ministry in one old translation or service. It's the same root term from what we get deacon or diakonos. And that, that root word there has that idea of ministry, of service, of meeting needs. And he says, I know your perseverance. I know you have love. I know you have faith. I know that you have service. And I know that you persevere. And the idea of perseverance is that you're holding steadfast under difficult circumstances. And I know that you're doing that as well. I see it. I see it. I see that you're wanting to stand true. That you're wanting to resist the temptation in many ways. I see that you're willing to be steadfast in what I've called you to do as a church. I notice that. And I notice that you're growing in these things as well and that your deeds of late are greater than at first it's amazing commendation amazing commendation they don't go unnoticed by the Lord and neither do your works or your sacrifices go unnoticed by the Lord he knows and is pleased with every expression of love that you give to others out of faith in his name he knows every deed of perseverance he knows every sacrifice of service he knows all the spiritual energy expired to persevere for his glory he knows that he sees it he's not ignorant to it but even though he's not ignorant to it he also reminds us, as He will this church, and what we'll look at next week, that those whom the Lord loves, He scourges, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. While He recognizes our obedience and our works of faith, and He's pleased by them, it doesn't mean that He ignores sin in the church. And it doesn't mean that He's willing to compromise His truth. And even though there is good... He calls to a total life of holiness, a total life of obedience, a total life of commitment. We can never compromise with sin, either as a church. We can never compromise with error, as either as a church or as individuals. And that's what he's going to call us to. And that's a good introduction as we come to the table now to remember the Lord, that we come together remembering His sacrifice, remembering that we are indwelled by the Spirit, we are the temple of the living God. We come together to be renewed in our faith and our trust that He stood in our place, He rose in our place, He lives in our place, and He's coming to return and bring us to where He is. But we also are reminded that it's a time to reflect and consider our commitment to holiness as well. Our commitment to obedience, our commitment to love Him, our commitment to walk with Him, our commitment to deal with any sin that we may be tolerating within our own heart or within the body. And we're reminded to come afresh and commit ourselves to the ways of the Lord. So as the men come and hand out the elements uh, while I pray, uh, and then we'll remember the Lord's Supper. Father, thank You for the Word, our Christ. We thank You for our salvation and for Your discipline. When we are disciplined by you, we are reminded that you love us. And when we feel the conviction of our sin, we are also reminded that you know that by the, your work of grace, we love you too. And we are reminded that such is your humility and your kindness that even when there are things to be addressed with disobedience, there are an acknowledgement of the things for which are done well, that are done well. What a tender and humble Savior you are. Indeed, that's what you said. You are gentle and humble in heart. May we reflect your character to one another. And as we continue to look at your message to Thyatira, may we be warned and shaped and directed as well in our own lives and as a church to see how we cannot hide behind good things and ignore what needs to be worked on 
But remember that you call us to a total life of holiness and obedience and truth. And that we are to demonstrate our faith ultimately and together pursuing that and encouraging one another to that same end. So would you use the table now in these next few moments to strengthen us, to embolden us, to encourage us, to remind us of grace, to remind us of our hope when we will one day stand before you blameless with great joy. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. His work, what He has done for us, and who we are in Him, and the promises, again, that we hold on to and we cling to, namely, not only of forgiveness of our sin, but His return, that we may be with Him where He is. There's nothing, it's not a sacrament, there's no grace communicated through this. It is an ordinance, we call it. It is a command of the Lord. It is a it is something that we as His church are to do together to remind us of the things that He designed it to bring to our attention, to nurture our faith as we together realize that we are the people of God, we are the body of Christ, we are the possessors of His Spirit, we are the ones who have received forgiveness of His sin. But it means then that this is an ordinance then for believers, it is not an ordinance for unbelievers. Uh, if you do not know Christ, it is not for you. It becomes a means of judgment rather than blessing. If you are a believer who knows Christ, and yet you are willfully, knowingly harboring sin in your life and in your heart that you are not willing to deal with, the table is not for you today until there's repentance. If you are a believer who has broken relationships that you're not willing to reconcile, then you are to leave your offering at the table there at the altar and go and be reconciled first and then take the table. If you are a believer who's aware of the sin in your heart that you hate and you're struggling with and fail, but continually confess and are fighting to put on righteousness and the power of the Spirit, the table is for you. It's for you. It's a reminder that we stand in grace. It's a reminder that He who is at work in us will continue to work in us until He perfects that work to the day of Christ Jesus. And this is a part of His encouragement to that promise. And so Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And remembering that evening that he stood transforming the Passover meal 
to what we now call the Lord's Supper. What was a shadow in the Passover is the substance in the work of Christ and commemorated in these elements, commemorating His finished work for us and His present intercession for us. And so He says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Uh, did John have a closing song? There you are. Please take your hymnals and stand with me. Open up to hymn number 13. We'll sing, Bless His Holy Name. We'll sing this through just one time. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless His holy name. Amen, Lord, and you have done great things. You have purchased us and redeemed us from our sin and from the wrath of God. And for that, we are eternally grateful. God, help us as we uh, commit to you. Help our love for you to increase. Help our faith to grow in you. Uh, give us, Lord, a heart that is serving towards you, serving towards your people, and persevere us, Lord, in the faith uh, that you have granted to us. We thank you, Lord, for all the great and wonderful things that you have done. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>